What's up, everybody? Today we are talking about cerebrovascular accidents. This is under the neuromuscular section, and this is going to be covering a little bit of the pathology of a stroke as well as the symptom presentation in both a left sided or a right sided stroke. So let's get started. So, anatomy, as I do at the beginning of most of my videos and explanations, it's the brain. Um, you have strokes in different parts of the brain. You can have it in the cerebellum. You can have it in one of the hemispheres or even just a section. A lot of it is determined by where did the blood flow either, if it's a hemorrhagic leak out or where did a uh, thrombus get embedded in the blood vessel that caused a stroke. So with that being said, moving on, there are different types of strokes and the most common ones are an ischemic stroke. So this is most strokes. I'd say it's definitely over 60% of strokes end up being an ischemic stroke. So this means that blood flow is blocked either by thrombus, which is forming in the actual blood vessel itself, or an embolus, which is a floating blood, vessel, blood clot that came from somewhere else. So most commonly, this is gonna come from somewhere else deep in the body where there ends up being a um, blood clot. So that ends up lodging in the brain, and that's how you'll get an ischemic stroke. The next common is a hemorrhagic. So this is where blood is actually um, hemorrhaging out into a certain part of the brain. Most common ones that you're going to see are either a subdural, so under the dura mater, under the subarachnoid, so in the subarachnoid space, so under the arachnoid mater, or an intracerebral, so that's like inside the brain itself in a part of the brain. So this is less common than an ischemic. However, it still is at least like most sources say at least like 15% of strokes, maybe even more. The next type of stroke that you'll see is a transient ischemic attack or a TIA. Most people are going to refer to this as a mini stroke, and it is... The way that you determine if it's a regular stroke or if it is a TIA is do the symptoms resolve within 24 hours? If they do, it would be considered a transient ischemic attack. Now, with this being said, a TIA does present exactly like a stroke. The only difference is it will resolve. So I've actually seen somebody who has had a TIA before. It is very scary and it is very strange how it just all of a sudden goes away. Um, also make sure for differential diagnosis that when we are trying to see if somebody's having a stroke that we're ruling out if it is Bell's palsy of paralysis of the face. So remember our FAST acronym. I'll go over that in another video though. So the most common cause of a stroke is going to be hypertension. So this is either secondary to some other pathology such as obesity or diabetes mellitus. However, hypertension is the big thing that is going to cause a lot of these problems. As I said before, other causes, obesity, diabetes mellitus, cigarette smoking, because cigarette smoking is more likely to cause blood clots. So that would be more of the ischemic kind of stroke and then high cholesterol because the blood vessels are thinning and also that plaque can pop off and end up being an embolus that ends up causing a stroke lodging in the brain somewhere. And then here's another thing that's kind of new on the market that the boards has just started kind of talking about a little bit and that you should be familiar definitely clinically for your patients is that anybody who is on birth control, they have a higher chance of developing strokes. So some birth controls have higher chances than others. Um, it just kind of depends, but you need to think about that because it could cause DVTs and then that ends up being a stroke. So keep that in mind clinically. The boards mm -hmm. hasn't exactly come around to that yet, but keep that in mind. So what does a stroke look like? So here are the common symptoms that you would see when it comes to a stroke. You would have hemiplegia, so that is paralysis on one side of the body. Hemiparesis, that is weakness on one side of the body because if it affects the, if it's a, a infarct or lesion to the right side of the brain, the left side of the body is going to be affected because of the crossing over in the spinal col the spinal cord of sensory and all that stuff. So then you'll have balance deficits because they'll have neglect to one side of their body. They won't realize that they're kind of leaning towards that side or something. They'll have difficulty ambulating because they don't have full strength of one side of their body. So that kind of causes problems as well. Dysphagia, so that difficulty swallowing, that is another thing due to, they'll have cognitive deficits. And I will talk about this in the next slide because it's kind of different for either side of the brain based on where the lesion is. The cognitive deficits will either go from they have difficulty with motor planning movements, or maybe they are just completely 
unaware of their spatial awareness of their body that they end up just kind of going and doing something that they probably shouldn't like they're like oh I'm fine I can walk up the stairs when they're dragging their leg behind them and then as I said before it does depend on the side so let's go over that left CVAs versus right-sided CVAs so remember if the infarct is on the left side of the body the right side of uh, if the infarct is on the left side of their brain, the right side of the body is going to have that weakness and hemiplegia. So thinking of that, also in the left side of the brain, this is where we have our Wernicke's area as well as our Broca's area. Broca is the expressive, so the difficulty talking. That is in the frontal lobe. So I think Broca, the word for mouth in Spanish is boca. So speaking and Broca's area in the frontal lobe. Broca is towards the front of the alphabet. So that's how I think of it there. Wernicke's area, that's towards Wernicke, W, towards the back of the alphabet, that's in the temporal lobe, and that is for receptive aphasia. So that means that they're having difficulty understanding speech. They may be talking normally, but it's kind of a bunch of gibberish and it's not actually coherent language. However, they're able to speak, but they're not understanding either the words that you're telling them or the um, written language that they're trying to read. Global aphasia would be it's affecting both of the Wernicke's and Broca's area. They could have apraxia, so this is difficulty with motor planning. This could either be an ideomotor or an ideational apraxia, and this is kind of, there's a lot going on with the ideomotor and ideational apraxia, so I'm going to do a separate thing talking just about that because that's something that a lot of people get confused on when they're reviewing this, but the apraxia is the difficulty with motor planning. For example, I would tell a patient, okay, brush your teeth. They're just staring at me and they don't they don't know what I just asked them. I'm gonna tell them, okay, pick up the toothbrush. They can do that. I'm like, okay, grab the toothpaste. They can do that. I'm like, squeeze the toothpaste. They can do those steps. They just can't plan the whole thing. So also with a left side stroke, you'll have left versus right discrimination deficits. So you are a little bit confused on which side you're actually grabbing towards, you're, that cross body stuff is a little bit more difficult, you're not aware of certain things due to the crossing over and everything. Right-sided hemianopsia, and that's where you've completely lost the right side of vision in both of your eyes. So that would be one of the things that would cause that. Um, again, processing deficits, so this would be a difficulty with processing the information that you're being given. So that's kind of with the aphasia and stuff like that. And these patients tend to be very frustrated at their current situation. And they're also going to be very overly cautious of um, any sort of activity that they're doing because they're very aware of their deficits. So right-sided strokes are a completely different game. So with the right side of the brain being affected, the left side is weaker and there's a like sensory deficits and also motor deficits and that's where you'll see the paresis and hemiplegia. So they'll have left side of neglect. So because there's all this weakness on the left side of the body because the lesion is in the right side of the brain, they're not paying attention to that side. Let's say I have my water bottle here. So I have if I put this to my left side and you have a left sided stroke person, they're not even going to know it's there. If you have here's another thing with stroke patients, especially with the right sided stroke patients. If you're approaching them approach them from the right side because then they can see you if you're approaching them from the left with all that neglect they're not paying attention and they don't see you and they might get scared these patients are also very they have very decreased attention span my professor likes to say they're very adhd like i don't like using that term because i think it makes it more stigmatized because i do have adhd but if that helps you remember what they're like go for it they have that decreased awareness and like if you're not focused on the task right away, they're going doing something else. They'll have that decreased spatial awareness. So this is where they'll develop the pusher syndrome. So that's where they think that they're sitting upright, but really they're leaning towards the side because they don't, they think they're upright, but they're literally like this. So that's also, they're aware and they're unaware of where their body is in space and time. That's why we work on a lot of proprioception with them and balance just to make sure they become more aware of their neglected side. They'll have judgment deficits. They'll, as I said before, they'll think I can walk up the stairs. I'm fine. Nope. No, you can't. You are not fine. Um, they're emotionally liable. So this is also where they get, they're kind of all over the place. They're like, they're happy one minute. They're sad the next because all, a lot of their emotions are processed on the right side of the brain. So Lots of problems with that. They tend to be impulsive. That kind of goes back to the, I'm going to go walk up the stairs. No, you're not. Not, not a good idea. 
So they're, if you're not paying close attention, these patients could start to wander off. Um, they'll have decreased abstract reasoning. So you're trying to tell them to imagine something. They can't do that because that's the side of the brain that's more artis artistic and kind of affects more of that um, abstract thought kind of thing. And then they'll have a left hemianopsia. So that's where the left field of vision in both eyes. So it's not like the left eye is not working. It's the left side of vision in each eye is affected. So how are we treating these patients? So it's based on the pathology. Is it left-sided? Is it right-sided? That's how we're gonna figure out what's going on. What type of stroke was it? Was it a cerebellar stroke? Was it a frontal lobe stroke? Was it in the brainstem? That's really scary because that one usually results in death. What type of stroke do they have? That's gonna determine our treatment function, our treatment um, goals and stuff like that. The first thing we want to do is control their hypertension because, as I said before, this is the number one cause. A lot of patients who have had strokes, I, I can count the patients that I've treated who all had strokes, they all had hypertension. It's a big problem. Put them on pharmacological management. So obviously this is outside our scope of practice because we can't prescribe medication. However, we need to be aware of what kind of hypertension medications our patients are on because, as you know, one of the side effects of being on a hypertension medication could mean that you go hypotensive because it overcorrects and they could be fatigued, passed out, orthostatic hypotension. Make sure we're aware of all that. As I said before, the big thing is the balance, the range of motion, the postural awareness, and postural control. We want to make sure that these patients are regaining their proprioception. So then they're able to be more aware of where their body is. So then they're placing their foot down in the right spot and decreasing their fall risk. That is probably one of the biggest things. The next thing that we wanna do with them, and there are very specific stroke protocols that have been developed through these techniques are the neurodevelopmental treatment or NDT. So that's kind of, that falls under the tapping, the picking up the glutes and everything, all of that fun stuff, uh, the pushing on the thighs to help them stand up, the blocking the knee, all that's the NDT stuff, the neurodevelopmental treatment. A lot of those techniques we'll use. We'll also use PNF, so proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So all of those fun stretches that we tend to learn about with the contract relax, we'll do that with those patients. We'll work on a lot of different of those techniques to try to work on regaining motor control, relaxing, decreasing spasticity, all that stuff. As I said before, the biggest thing we wanna do with these patients is decrease their fall risk because as you know, if a patient falls, they have a whole new slew of problems that they could be dealing with. They could have fractures and stuff like that. And they already have a stroke. They already have a lot going on. We wanna make sure they're being safe and safe in their home. So obviously if we're working an inpatient, we're making sure that they're safe enough to go home, working on ambulation, walking around, spasticity management, as I said before, they're, they might be on anti-spasticity meds like baclofen and stuff. All of that stuff will help with the patients regaining their function and mobility. So working on functional mobility in the home, we want to make sure this patient is able to get up from their bed, go to the bathroom safely, and return to their bed without falling or having any other issues of tripping, twisting ankles, all that stuff. So key words that we want to think of when we're seeing this on the boards is what side of the brain are we looking at? What's affected? Where is the lesion? Is it in the frontal lobe? Is it in the parietal lobe? Is it in the occipital lobe? What's going on? Where is it? Look for those words saying left-sided frontal lobe stroke, something like that, or see what artery it is. We'll go over the arteries another time of where the blood flow goes to the brain and understanding that. The aphasia, apraxia, and any sort of language processing problem that's all left side. So if it doesn't say which side of the body, that it's, which side of the brain it's affecting, and you see those three words, you're thinking left. It was a left-sided lesion because those problems really only show up if it's on the left side. Any sort of spatial deficits, lack of attention, emotional liability, the impulsivity, all that stuff. If you're not seeing a side, you're thinking right side for that. So if they're all over the place, no spatial awareness, lack of attention, all that stuff, we're thinking right side. So remember, if it's a right-sided stroke, the left side has the hemiparesis and hemiplegia. Same thing for the opposite side. If the left side has left side of the brain has a stroke, the right side is not working when it comes to motor stuff and sensory things. So sample question. A physical therapist assistant is performing the six-minute walk test with a patient who's recovering from a right-sided cerebrovascular accident. Which location would be appropriate to perform this test in? One, a rehab gym. Two, their room three, a hallway outside of their room, or four, an empty hallway. So I'll give you a minute to think about that.
All right, guys, so the answer is an empty hallway. So if we're looking at this question, we're seeing that this patient, so the six minute walk test is something for um, functional mobility and um, fall risk and stuff like that. So we're seeing that this patient is recovering from a right-sided cerebrovascular accident. Okay, so when we see right side, we're thinking this patient is probably that lack of spatial awareness, that impulsivity. Also think about, remember, they have that very short attention span. So they're kind of all over the place if they're not super focused on a task. The six minute walk test is six minutes. And I don't know about you guys, sometimes I'm zoning out after 30 seconds and I'm, I'm done. So for this patient, an appropriate place to perform this test would be an empty hallway. So the trick is that the rehab gym might seem like a good idea. There's a lot going on there. Six minutes is a, is a lot of time for them to become distracted. Like, oh, what's Joe doing over there? They're gonna, they're gonna start getting distracted. So it needs to be somewhere quiet without distractions going on. The room is the trick question, is the trick answer. There's not enough space to properly do the six minute walk test based on how the boards wants it described. I believe they need at least 30 meters or so to walk back and forth or something like that. There's a specific amount of, I, I will look it up. There's a specific amount of distance that they need to walk and turn around and come back for the textbook official version of the six minute walk test. So the, their room is too small to be able to perform this appropriately. The hallway outside of their room, while this might be a good idea, there's still people going back and forth, back and forth. The empty hallway is, and if you can find one in an acute care setting, that would be great. But an empty hallway would be the best place for this patient so they're not being distracted by everything. There's enough space to, for them to turn around and go back and forth, back and forth for six minutes. So then this would be appropriate. Thanks for joining me today, guys, and I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your Tuesday evening, and I will see you soon.